before we proceed i would request sri manoj mehta to present a bouquet to sri abhishek joshi who is a member secretary of the uh, action committee against corruption in india so i would request sri manoj mehta to present a bouquet to abhishek joshi please be seated i would now request our pt from navsari gujarat sri ravin desai to uh, introduce dr swami respected dr swami professor vaidyanathan jagdish shetty ji dr chaturvedi ji M R Venkatesh ji, it is indeed a sacred moment for me to introduce Dr. Swami. Dr. Swami was born on 15 September 1939. I will brief you about him, which makes him unique from other politicians and academicians. After getting masters from Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, he went to Harvard University to pursue his PhD in economics. He is one of those few individuals who earned their PhD in one and a half years, which is still a sort of record. <clears throat> Challenging the status quo is not his current habit, but during his masters in his twenties, he challenged then director of the Indian Statistical Institute, Mahala Nobis Fractal Graphical Analysis Theory, and as usual, quashed it. Dr Swami's paper was published in the Econometrica journal and noticed by Harvard and Harvard then called Dr Swami on full Rockefeller scholarship At Harvard Dr Swami wrote research papers and worked with two Nobel laureates Dr Simon Kuznets and Paul Samuelson the father of modern economics After meeting Jay Prakash Narayan at Harvard Dr Swami decided to respond to the higher call and joined Indian politics In 1971 at the age of 32 Dr Swami published a book called Indian Economic Planning and Alternative Approach which was then noticed by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi In 1976 during emergency he was one of the most wanted which is now even evident in the WikiLeaks cable and he went to USA to make people aware about the emergency and death of democracy in India when in 1976 he re-entered parliament in a dramatic manner after an exile and again escaped dr swami became a national hero later on he became the minister of commerce and law in in of india in the chandrashekhar government and wrote the fundamental architecture of india's economical reforms which were subsequently carried out by the narsimh rao and manmohan singh in which government dr swami became the chairman of the commission of labor standards in international trade equivalent to the rank of a cabinet minister even it was acknowledged by prime minister dr manmohan singh that it was dr swami who envisaged the india's economical reforms <laughs> dr swami knows mandarin chinese language very well and is considered an expert in the chinese economics and he has authored various books on this he was the pioneer who initiated the opening of the kailash mans mansarovar yatra by chinese government in 1980s <laughs> dr swami is also credited for his initiatives and vision to have good relations with israel dr swami also fought the ram setu case single handedly and won it <laughs> now he is fighting in the supreme court whether ram setu should be declared as a heritage structure or not the importance of this case is immense as it will prove all western and british theories false about india's heritage and therefore restore us as the oldest civilization in the history of mankind <laughs> dr swami has honored the 2g spectrum spectrum scam which has shaken the upa 2s foundations the figure of 1.76 lakh crore which sir has discovered has in a way awakened the whole nation about corruption 
As Mr. Venkatesh rightly said, using existing existing laws, Dr. Swami proved that corruption can be diminished. I think more status of 2G we would like to know from him only. Last but not the least, many may not know, but Dr. Swami is one of those few leaders who were a great friend of both Shri Murari Bai Desai and Shri Rajiv Gandhi. And now to address the first of its kind Global Patriotic People Conference. i request the man who is there fighting for all of our future with love affection and respect whom we know as one man army dr subramaniam swami hiren hiren said from walsad will present a bouquet to dr swami hiren said Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Jagdish Shetty, Sir Abhishek Joshi, Professor Vaidyanathan, Professor Arvind Chaturvedi, and M R V M R Venkates, and friends uh, who are now part of the great PT Army. the new army that is emerging in the country i hope you realize that we are today on a verge of a new revolution a revolution based on social media for which the vested interests have no answer they cannot censor you they can try to control you but they won't succeed and the most important part of this social media revolution is that it is gender neutral both uh, women and men can participate equally i am very pleased to see such a large turnout of women in this audience of our pts i think uh, the other important thing is that for the first time after freedom struggle we are seeing the educated classes in revolt for too long the educated classes uh, abdicated their interest in politics created a vacuum which was filled by criminals and corrupt people as arvind chaturvedi correctly pointed out it is we who have made it possible and now we must win back that theater of war called democracy and the battlefield which is called elections back to those who are committed to this country nationalist and well educated i'm supposed to speak today on the current affairs politics and the way forward current affairs is a outcome of past politics whatever has happened in the last 60 65 years is responsible for the current situation and uh, for having a way forward we will have to search for new ways of doing politics so that's why today i will speak to you about how we should position ourselves by which we can bring about change if you read the biography of all successful revolutionaries and doesn't mean necessarily revolutionary has to be violent someone who brings about major change mahatma gandhi was a revolutionary vivekananda of course was a revolutionary visionary the same way jay prakash narayan was a revolutionary because he brought together various opposition parties and thus made it possible for congress party to be 
replaced in the center for the first time in 30 years after independence. But if you look at all the revolutionaries of India as well as abroad, you notice that the most important message that comes out of their life is that they were not worried about whether they will succeed or not. They were only positioned when the change came. And almost all revolutionaries of the view that change does not come because you are the person who brought the change. Change comes through events. And the revolutionary is one who is positioned at that time to take advantage of that, event, uh, of that change, that uh, event. So when uh, World War II ended, Britain won the war. Suddenly Britain began to feel apprehensive that there is an atmosphere of revolt in the country. The Navy had gone on revolt. Army men were talking openly about not taking command from the British. Even though they won the war, they felt now they will not be able to remain in India. And at that time Gandhi was present. And they could hand him the power. And that's how we achieved independence. In 1977, the event was Mrs. Gandhi declared an election. We did not bring down the emergency. The emergency was well established. And everybody was predicting to me, why you are wasting your life like this? This will never go. We poor people do not know what democracy means. And Indira Gandhi will remain for another 20 years. After that, Sanjay Gandhi will come and after that, his dog will come. But you have no place in politics. <clears throat> but one day, Mrs. Gandhi declared an election. And because of Jay Prakash Narayan, a Janta Party was in place. And the people voted for that party. So don't ask ever this question, will this ever change? Nothing will change in India. I find young people asking me this question all over the country. As uh, Professor Vaidyanathan correctly said, change is in the air. Some event will happen. I don't know what that event is. <laughs> Professor Vaidyanathan says, I know the event, but I'm not telling. But I want new sort of people not apathetic to India. Not a one-dimensional mind. That one-dimensional mind which says, I must make a good career. I was very disappointed when I went to the IIM. I don't know whether IIMB is different from IIMA. But when I address the students of IIMA, which is Ahmedabad, the answers everybody gave me when I asked them, why did you do all this effort of competitive exam and come here, is that we want a good job. Many times I have told you, I have tweeted also, that at Harvard where I had students from many, many countries, I used to pose one question. Now that you are completing your degree here, you are going out in the real world, what kind of career are you going to pursue? To me, there are two kinds of careers you can pursue. One is that you take risk and try something on your own. You might become a billionaire like Microsoft uh, 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 chairman became. Or you may fall flat on your face and be on the streets. Or an alternative, you take a job. Every year, every month you will get your salary. Every year it will rise by 5% and at the age of 60 you will get your provident fund and then you uh, buy a house and watch television for the rest of your life. Which kind of life would you prefer? And American students invariably used to ask me, what's the probability we will fall flat on our face? Then we can, I will tell you the answer the American student used to say. But the Indian student generally would say, no we prefer the second job. 
And when I ask them why, when that is guaranteed poverty, why you want such a job? Why don't you take the risky prosperity alternative? They said, because it is guaranteed, that's why we want that job. Even if it is poverty. This is the mindset that after 1947, this English curriculum has produced in the minds of our young people. It's not that we don't have talent, we have proved ourselves in so many fields. Software, many of you have proved today out of <coughs> this ranking of 1 to 5 of SCI, CMM for software companies, the rank, top rank of 5, the largest number of companies, companies in the world are Indian companies, 36 Indian companies. They have, even the American companies are only 15. And China has just won. We have demonstrated in Japan through the Deming Prize for Automobile in Ancillaries, the first prize year after year. So there are places you can see, and the Indians who are brought up in the United States, not shackled the way our children are shackled in their education, they are on top of the competitive exams in America. Now Indians are acceptable almost everywhere. And many of the things that we in our country invented now the Americans are using. When I was a college student we used to all snigger at the idea of yoga. Said, What is this contortion? The madness, madness it is. Why should we be living in the past? But very soon the Americans accepted it. Jane Fonda came on video on yoga and soon all Indians began saying yoga is a very good thing. Now everybody is doing yoga. Same thing with Sanskrit. Today NASA has accepted Sanskrit. American government has given special grants for any college teaching Sanskrit. But if you say it in India that you must learn Sanskrit, say communal. <laughs> but sooner or later when the Americans start speaking Sanskrit, then you'll see that we'll also, as fashion, start learning Sanskrit. So this country has been a developed country for centuries. People used to come all over from the world to this country. For it to become developed again, we have got everything except the mindset. And that mindset today, the Indian mindset, is typified by Manmohan Singh. He's sitting in the most powerful office in this country, but he's not able to handle a fifth class pass Italian woman. <clears throat> he has the entire file about her with him, which the intelligence RAW has given to her. To him. But he is frightened of her. Why? And that's why I keep repeating to you that neither numbers nor strength by itself is enough. You must have a mindset in tune with that. You may have a thousand goats in one place and one tiger will come the numbers are with the goats, but they will be the one who will be running. And the tiger, single tiger will chase them for his lunch. You can go to a circus and see five well-fed lions inside a cage. A thin, wiry ringmaster will come inside the cage, lock the door and order them all to climb up on the bench. All of them will climb up on the bench. Then you say, open your mouth. They'll open their mouth. He'll put his head inside it. Why don't, the, why don't these lions attack him? Why don't they bite his head off when he puts his head inside? Because the lion from, from its cub stage has been prepared mentally to obey this ringmaster. Same thing, I mean, in, uh, in Hindi or Sanskrit we call uh, lion as Singh. And now Manmohan Singh is a circus Singh. Brought up this way. I've known him for years. His mindset is like that. To obey. 
That is the mindset you should break out of. And how do we break out of it? Now, <clears throat> we have big problems ahead of us. Very, very big problems. Never this 10 years or nearly 10 years of UPA has put together so many problems. It's going to be difficult for for us to get out of it unless we take some bold steps and bold have a bold outlook. In 1990 when I became minister, what had happened? There was a foreign exchange crisis. Why? Because in 1985, Rajiv Gandhi decided to liberalize imports. And after almost, uh, what, 1950 to 1985, that's 35 years, industrialists, private companies could not import license without a, uh, could not import machinery without a license. And so suddenly they got an opening. But Rajiv Gandhi made the rule that you have to raise the money abroad. And all these industrialists did the easiest thing they could do took short-term loans. These short-term loans were due for repayment within five years. It's easy to get short-term loans. And so a large amount of machinery was brought, imported into India. As a consequence, our industrial growth rate went up. It went up to 11-12% during Rajiv Gandhi's period. But by 1990, 1989, Rajiv Gandhi was out. 1989, V.P. Singh came to power. And then what did he do? V.P. Singh started distributing, writing off. And meantime, these international events took place. Gulf War, prices of oil shot up. And there was no money in the, uh, in the foreign exchange, in our foreign exchange reserves. And then these payments became due. We were short of two billion dollars and we had to declare bankruptcy. Default of payments would have been a big disaster. At that time, uh, Chandrasekhar told me, Kuch karo, nito hum sab marenge. I don't know what to do. I mean, where do you get two billion dollars? I could go to the World Bank or to the IMF, but then they would put such stringent conditions that... Uh, the communists and the left wing all would make such galata, they won't be able to get it through parliament. But fortunately at that time, luck was there. That's why I say, if you strive, suddenly some event will take place. The American ambassador came to see me and he said that he wanted American planes coming from Philippines to refuel in India before going on to Kuwait where the war was going on. And I made a deal with them that we will change our policy never to allow foreign planes to land in India, foreign military planes to land in India. In times of war was the policy followed from Jawaharlal Nehru's time. We changed that, allowed American planes to land, but the deal was that they will get us $2 billion from the IMF without condition, which the Americans have the power to get done. So that changed it. And then, what was considered impossible happened. All these great economists who are run away from this country, these left-wing economists like Amartya Sen used to say, this is a Hindu rate of growth, 3.5% per year. India can never grow faster than that. It was actually a Soviet model rate of growth. But because that was failing, therefore they passed it off as Hindu rate of growth. But just by deregulation, we were able to reach 8% during the Narasimha Rao's period. Could anyone have predicted that we'll grow at 8%? No. Everybody thought India cannot, this is a big country, because how can we, there's so much poverty, there's this, unemployment, all kinds of things you hear, this defeatist logic. But those economic reforms brought about change. I prepared the blueprints. Narasimha Rao had the political guts to get it implemented. And all that Manmohan Singh did was to put a signature on the file. 
of course he is a he is a economist of great repute but he doesn't have that that savvy that guts to get it done if as finance minister as the media gave him all the credit he could get so much done then why as prime minister is not able to get it done if anybody is to get the largest share of the credit it should be narsimha rao and see how he was humiliated so i am saying therefore first thing is your mindset don't think in these negative terms these negative terms are always will produce negative vibes in your body think positively and therefore you have to get some spiritual guidance which will the gita will give you that you have only your right to action the results lord krishna says i will decide you will get the reward for your karma but what and where in which form that i will decide so therefore you must now say i am going to do this i am going to change india i am going to work on the, in this direction if it comes fine as lord's wish it doesn't come fine but i have done my duty that mindset you have to develop then only will become a new indian because today the indian is ah kuch nahi hone wala hai you know nothing will happen what did they tell me when i went to the court what the you no minister ever gone to jail they are not going to give you permission congress party will fight this but i went to court and said that the manmohan singh is not uh, giving me permission to prosecute raja he has been sitting on my letter seeking permission for one and a half years all these kapil sibal and all said who is swami every citizen any citizen can write a letter and the prime minister take notice well the supreme court thought otherwise and said to mr manmohan singh file an affidavit why you didn't reply to dr swami's letter and tell us why you are not giving sanction <laughs> never in the history of india or the history of any world the prime minister has been directly sent a notice by the supreme court nobody would have thought this happened but it happened had i not tried you would have never known it can happen so without trying to give up is losing the war losing the battle before even starting the battle lose the battle after fighting it no harm but to lose the battle before even fighting it that is what is wrong so what is the problems that we face today we have a economy that is heading for a crash let there be no doubt about it and that crash is particularly sharp in two areas which can engulf the whole economy one is we have a fiscal deficit a deficit in our in our budget central government budget which is now reached center and states combined to more than 12% that is called the latin american rate because the latin americans frequently have financial crises because of this factor our budget is not balanced and the deficit is now reached this stage the deficit is covered by making the indian government owned banks to part with loans and they have to give it because it is indian owned bank which means that private sector will not get enough money that much money that you take away cannot go for private investment so that money is taken and it is not invested by the government of india it is used for revenue expenditure which means it just it will not going to produce growth but the problem is that today if you get 1 rupee more of loan from the bank by the government then you have to pay back 97 paisa as previous return of the previous loan and with interest it's called amortization so only 3 paisa is the gap in another 2 years it will become more than 1 rupee you borrow 1 rupee 
you have to pay back more one rupee. That's called a debt trap. How are you going to get out of it? By pruning the government expenditure. Easy said, easier said than done. What will you prune? Politically, tell me, can I prune subsidies? No. Can I prove defen- prune de- defense expenditure? No. Can I prune police expenditure? No. Can I prune uh, interest payments on past loans? No. Can I prune government salaries and pension payments, provident fund payments? No. If you add up all the things that you cannot prune, it works out to be 99% of the budget, budget expenditure. So you can't prune. So where is it going to come from? So you mean you'll raise the taxes like every day they're raising on petrol prices and all that? This is madness. Because these things have wide-ranging effects. So where is the resource going to come from? Well, I can tell you where the resource is going to come from. In fact, when I suggest that abolish income tax, everybody says we are having a research problem, a resource problem, this man is saying abolish income tax. Why should I not abolish income tax? Who pays income tax? Because of people like uh, M.R. Venkates, rich people don't pay income tax. These chartered accountants find <laughs> how to balance the... Uh, and they'll show a loss when they're making a profit. The poor people don't pay income tax because they don't have in- in- income. It is the middle class, professionals, software engineers, doctors, these are the people who are paying. Because you catch them at the source. So if you were to, and that's harassment galore. So abolish it. And there will be liberation. The people, middle class particularly, and their wives. I don't know whether your wife agrees with your sentiment that women are superior to men in India. You have, you have our permission to say so? Somebody said, I am a boss in my own house and have my wife's permission to say so. <laughs> so, this money will go into savings. Savings will go into investment. Investment will go make growth. Growth through indirect taxes will give you revenue. And it can be shown that the amount you lose by income tax revenue will be m- much less then the income tax, the revenue you get from indirect tax due to increase in growth. But I am saying, but what about the fundamental question of the debt trap? That question has to be answered. There is no shortage of resource in India. If you had auctioned the 2G spectrum scam, uh, 2G spectrum licenses, if you had auctioned it, you would have got at least 1,76,000 crores. If you had auctioned the coal blocks, you would have got 9 lakh crore rupees. If you auctioned the oil fields which you gave to the Ambani's, you would have got 24 lakh crore rupees. What is the total tax bill of India? Direct and indirect tax combined, only 4.5 lakh crore rupees. Here you got... Uh, 1,76,000 1, from 2G spectrum, from 3G you have got uh, already 4 lakhs, then you are going to get 4G very soon, and that's because your documents, 10,000 documents can be sent on 4G, therefore there is going to be a big demand for it, particularly from the corporate sector. And therefore you are going to get 7, 8 lakhs, uh, lakh crores in that, no shortage of that. Coal blocks, unlimited coal blocks we have in India. So, the total tax bill is only four and a half lakh crores. Then if uh, the next government uh, picks the brain of Professor Vaidyanathan and gets all the money abroad, which is kept by what a simple solution he has suggested. I have already tested this from one of the most well-known jurists of India, Fali Nariman, who told me many years ago that this is the way to do it. The only difference between what he said... And what Professor Vaidyanand said is, Vaidyanand said, pass it through Parliament. I say, 
wait till parliament goes on recession and it do, and bring out a ordinance then the ordinance becomes law till the parliament meets again that means six months away so you can get an immediate law and all this money how much is it 70 lakh crore rupees are abroad which are illegal money where is the shortage of resources there is no shortage of resources we have potential now to spurt in our economy what about agriculture they say the drag people are committing suicide but do you know that we are even today the cheapest producers of agricultural products go to any wto publication it will come out we are the only ones who can give subsidy to agriculture on basis of international calculations there is a formula by which they calculate what percentage of subsidies you can give india can give 150% 50% of the production of agriculture value of agriculture production as subsidy because our international prices are so much below potential is enormous yield per acre is so low what is the difficulty in raising the yield per acre the indian council of agricultural research is producing 11 times as much yield per acre as the common plot in the country through experimental plots by giving correct water uh, electricity etc so if the indian agriculture uh, indian council of agriculture research plots can produce so much why can't we produce the whole the sand dunes of egypt produce three times as much cotton per acre as india does the fertile lands of india does i give i give an example very often we have 150 million cows which produce 200 liters per year on the average one israeli cow on the average produces 11000 liters per year imagine if 150 million cows started producing 11000 liters per year how much milk we will have where will you put that milk export it because the price of milk is nine times more in europe than in india so you export it well you can't export it because the wto the 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 subsidies which the uh, europeans give make it impossible for you to compete so to remove that subsidies you'll have to argue in the wto because wto says you cannot put these subsidies so you have to argue you have to make deals you have to get it done but there is no focus so india can become a global economic uh, global agricultural power all you have to do is empower the farmers give them every district should have a small air field put cold storage is everywhere enable them to use the internet to find out where the market is it's not only wheat rice vegetables fruits but even flowers milk of course these all these can be produced in abundance in india and exported it requires a focus that focus has never been there because this nehru craze for industrialization there was nothing wrong with the industrialization but this total focus only on that and extracting resources from agriculture to finance industrialization is the biggest blunder ever committed so it's not a problem there at all similarly on this today the most alarming statistics that has come out is called the cap, uh, current account deficit 6.5% of gdp all through the last 20 years it was never more than 1.5% it was a deficit but 1.5% today 6.5 very soon if tomorrow all this uh, money that comes in foreign uh, investment dries up or slows down we are going to have a foreign exchange crisis a major foreign exchange crisis let me tell you one thing financial system is the most important part of your economic system and no country has been able to make sustained progress unless the financial system is good we need people like professor vaidyanathan who understands and mr venkatesh who understand the financial system 
very well. That for example I'll give you. All through the 60s and 70s people said, Latin America is the new developed world. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, they will all become fully developed countries. They all had in the mid-70s a financial crisis and they have never recovered. Even today there are daily financial crises in these countries. Everybody has forgotten these countries. Then there was this East Asian tigers. Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Malaysia. They said these are the new tigers. World Bank even wrote a book, East Asia Miracle, in 1995. In 1997, these countries had a financial crisis. Japan collapsed. And even today, Japan has not got up. There's no Japan. Where's the Japan growth story today? Of course, the World Bank had to write another volume immediately. East Asia Miracle Reconsidered. <laughs> volume 2. The... the Economist who was my classmate who got the Nobel Prize was a man called Stieglitz. He wrote the first volume, he had to write the second volume also. But I could never meet him again, otherwise I would ask him what happened. Now, these, there are examples all over the world. What happened to the American? The American system would not have collapsed but for these derivatives. Where they have made it possible, see the, the collapse of the American system, please understand how fragile our financial system is. The banks used to give loans for buying or building houses to residents, US citizens. Now one day these wise guys from Harvard Business School devised a, a financial derivative with which they went to the bank and said, listen, you have given so much money to build a house. And so this much money of yours is frozen. You will get it back in installments, that is true. So we propose that with a 10% discount, we will give you this money which you have given to that householder, and that person to buy, the, buy or build a house. And we will collect the installments from him. So the bank was very pleased. Suddenly they got their money back, most, uh, minus 10%. And uh, these people then went with that to collect their installments. And they got 10% value for it. So they, made, they also made money. It's like this Lehman Brothers, Fannie Mae, all these, these are the companies who are doing it. So the bank now with this money said, well, why not give another loan? So they gave another loan to another person to build another house. Immediately they came back, 10% discount. We give you the money and take it. Like that, the thing started snowballing and there was a household boom. But the number of people who are in a high income bracket who could pay back the installment started reducing because you are covering them. So finally the banks decided they had become greedy. So they decided to give to people whose income was not very high. That was called subprime loan. That's why it was called subprime loan. And they gave it. But then a small recession took place for some reason. And suddenly these people said, we can't pay the installments. We want to take the house back. And suddenly, you know, banks are being, uh, these um, Lehman Brothers and all, suddenly are loaded with... Uh, Houses which they can't sell, the property market dropped naturally, and that's how the crash took place, and that's how it all happened. This should not have affected India. Because our banks were under strict control of the Reserve Bank on exposure to the private, uh, uh, to the real estate market. But our problem was this participatory note, which for the first time I see uh, M.R. Venkatesh didn't mention. The, the Chidambaram Sonia Gandhi instrument for looting India. 
I have said it so many times in so many PT conferences, you know what party participatory notes are. These participatory notes have brought billions of dollars into India. In September 2008, 61 billion dollars left our country because participatory notes brought money and the condition was they can take it out any time they want. So it was a short run. It was called hot money or portfolio investment. So that went out. As a consequence, the stock market collapsed. And that's how we got our economic crisis. Otherwise, had the participatory note not been there, there would have been no economic crisis. So this, today we have this problem. We have a current account. Now where are you going to make up? Well, you have to find new ways of exporting. It can be found. Today China is importing, China's so-called export miracle is nothing but importing semi-processed goods from Japan, Taiwan and others. Take this Lenovo. Lenovo is, is written made in China. But it is not made in China. It is made in Taiwan. And it comes in semi-processed uh, state, then they put the box over it, the glass over it, the, the buttons on it, and then put a chap, uh, a chap made in China. And that is called value adding. Now the, then they export it to America and Europe. Why can't uh, Taiwan directly export? Because their labor is expensive. So therefore, they want to save on labor costs, so they are sending it to China. So China imports from East Asia, semi-processed goods, adds value and then exports it to Europe and United States. They get a huge balance of trade surplus with the West and Europe, that is Europe and America, and a smaller deficit with East Asia for importing. But that deficit is covered up by the surplus. So China has built up a huge foreign exchange server. So, what, in, what India can do? Should have done it already. They should have gone to these East Asian countries and say, we are a democratic country. You are sending it there. Or you should have told the Americans, because these are all American chumcha countries. You see, you should have told the Americans. You say, you want to be friends with us? then please ask these countries to send some part of that trade to us. But the Japanese, the Taiwanese, what do they say? Hey, India is full of hassle. In China they take a bribe at the top level, but then after that everything works smoothly. Here in India everybody has to be paid. Octroi you have to pay. Electricity connection you have to pay. Land allotment you have to pay. It's a harassing thing. We don't like hassles. Remove your hassles. Make your road without potholes. Make the turning round of a ship from seven days that you are using, you require today, to seven hours like in Singapore. Singapore does it even less. So then we will come. So here you want to export. This is the way. What is there in building roads? There is nothing. It's all corruption that is responsible. So therefore, if you get your act together on this, you can yeah, export in a big way and you will, you will ruin the Chinese economy on top of that. Because China has no domestic production worth the name. Whatever you see, razzle dazzle or China is, is not indigenous. We are more indigenous. Our manufacturing sector is much more Indian than the manufacturing sector of China being Chinese. But we don't realize our potential. So therefore, here again I'm saying, we are on the verge of, we can bring about an economic revolution, provided we follow the right policies. Like in 1990, we were in such a miserable condition, people thought we are done for. We are going to become a colony of the IMF, World Bank. Go and read the paper cuttings of that time. And overnight we became a miracle. The same way today, India can overnight transform and by 2020, it can become a global economic power. And if China has an economic crisis, a financial break, breakdown, as I'm expecting, then we will overtake China. And we have a young population. This young population, if you educate them properly, they'll become inventors, innovators. 
There's so many things to be done which the Americans will not do. Because they have got surplus of oil, they will not work on hydrogen fuel cells. But we have to depend on the Arab world for, uh, for oil, 85%. So, if we, if we decide to have automobiles go by hydrogen fuel cells batteries, then we will not lead oil. Or at least the dependence will go down very substantially. It will affect if all in the world people start taking to hydrogen fuel cells, it's the cleanest. It won't give you pollution like alcohol. I mean, by um, uh, crude oil uh, produced petrol. It's a very clean fuel. If you do it, the Americans will not do it because this research, because they got plenty of oil. And now they have discovered a new source called shale oil. There's no shortage of oil in China. So the oil companies are very powerful in America. They say, no, 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 no. All our investments will go down the drain. You can't switch to hydrogen fuel cells. But we can. If we do, and then others do, then the Arabs will have to go back to their tents and their camels. <laughs> they will no more be able to finance the terrorists. So all this requires policy. The policy is known. It doesn't require a new set of people who are willing to do it. Or a crisis which forces us to do it. India has always responded very well to crisis, so I am looking forward to another crisis very soon. <clears throat> I have spoken to you many times about corruption. This can be rooted out, it's not a problem. But I think we need a cultural change. This craze for material prosperity, which has gripped us after this globalization, that should be moderated a bit. We need to materially progress. But we must also have values. Our values are different. In America, a leader has to be the most well-dressed person. Suit, boot, tie, shining shoes. But in our country, Mahatma Gandhi just had a longoti, and everybody followed him. Because we don't look upon people in high up in society as people who must be necessarily well-dressed. Our sadhus have got only bhagwa. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Ram Dev, Swami Dayan and Saraswati. See all these sadhus, very simply dressed. But see their Pope, how well dressed he is. Never in anything but satin. So we have, uh, we have always felt that material progress must be balanced with spiritual advancement. So sacrifice, simplicity, these are the values. We are losing that. The moment you start losing it, then you become greedy. When you think money can decide everything, then society will become corrupt. We are corrupt, getting more and more corrupt today because money is everything. You can buy anything. Even that fellow who raped this young girl, he offered some money, he said, le jao. What cheek? So, and then even social values will come down. Today, m m people who are raping and killing, they all think that can ultimately it can be decided by money. Going to jail, court, oh, we can buy this man, we can buy that man. It's only a short term thing. Dawood Ibrahim thinks so. Yeah, nothing has, no one has done anything to him. So, consequently, I am saying that this craze for money, this value system has to change. You can't decide a person's social status on money. You can certainly say nothing wrong with earning money. And if you want to acquire social status, then donate what you don't, you know, beyond what you have earned. I mean, beyond you, what you need, you give to society. Philanthropy. Even the American society have better philanthropy than us. So, consequently, we today have to examine this from this angle. Now, <clears throat> we have Therefore, to go for a new mindset. I have many, many questions. If I cover all these, we'll be in trouble. We'll have, well, then I'll have to sit till tomorrow morning. <laughs> Maybe we'll have another conference. And then the topic will be... Yeah. We are faced with a major national security threat. 
our neighbor pakistan is soon going to the grip of taliban i've been warning this for the last 3 years consistently she pakistan is essentially controlled by the army the army has divided pakistan into seven parts they call and each is headed by a general called a core commander if these seven people meet that's the end how did musharraf come to power when nawaz sharif was prime minister these seven core commanders met and then one brigadier went with a lock and key and he put a lock on the supreme court put a lock on the parliament of pakistan and a lock on nawaz sharif's house also told him stay inside and called musharraf and gave him the oath of office he became martial law administrator the impact of taliban on the army started growing from the captain level several years ago now the captain has got become lieutenant colonel lieutenant colonel to colonel colonel to brigadier and now a few have come to be major general in another year or two there will be generals there will be core commanders they will take over then we'll have a war because taliban has made it very clear india is an incomplete chapter of islamic history when i speak about this people think i'm anti muslim i'm not anti muslim why should i be anti muslim those muslims in india who identify with india they are as much uh, my brothers and sisters their dna is the same i am ready to test it and my family i have got all religions i got jews muslims parsis christians is there anything left no. <laughs> jews also there Yeah. Well, you have a daughter and I have a son then we can think of something. <laughs> so the question is not religion. The question is question of cultural values. Hindus anyway accept that all religions lead to God. so we cannot be against islam because you pray to allah we cannot be against christians because you pray to uh, to christ and the lord but at the same time we want to make sure that the history of this country which is a long long history is not subverted islam went to iran and completely made it 100% muslim within 15 years went to mesopotamia and, and uh, babylon which is now iraq in 17 years 100% muslim then went to egypt and made uh, egypt in 21 years 100% muslim christians went to europe in 50 years they made it 100% christian here 800 years of muslimic rule 200 years of christian rule we are still 83% hindu when hindus were 800 uh, 100 uh, hindus were 100% of india we received the jews and the uh, and the and the and the uh, parsis we built their temples for them when the muslims came in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, kerala they were called Mo- we got them married and we call them mapilai which is in english called mopla but we have found that when the muslim population in any area becomes 100% or 75% overwhelming majority their approach to minorities is different than from hindus towards minorities in saudi arabia i cannot build a temple we got how many 2 million uh, indians uh, hindus there or uh, hindus and muslims but they will not allow to build a temple 
they will not allow you to celebrate diwali they will not allow you to do satyanarayan puja inside your house they will not even allow you to carry ramchandra ji's photograph in your pocket that's their law i don't grudge it if so so saudi arabia is another country if they want this law they can have but in india we also find in kashmir what is the fault of the kashmiri pandits why have they been driven out because i can read out it's i've got the statements in of 1990 made by hizbul mujahideen and jamaat e islami all these statements where they have said we want kashmir to go according to islamic laws and the sharia and if any minority wants to live here they must abide by islamic laws that is their mindset is very clear it is this hindu whose mind is very confused you see i am all for secularism if i could understand what that means maybe you can ask uh, professor vaidyanathan to explain but the fact is if it means treating all religions as equal that is fundamental part of hinduism so i have in my party muslims who have known me for years and years they have never left me they understand me but this is the what i am propagating is so dangerous for the mullahs and the extremists that they want to make out that i am anti muslim and this so called liberal left wing they are also afraid this fellow will confuse the muslim and he'll make them all one in fact iqbal used to call india sare jahan se acha hindustan hamara so it, this hindu muslim unity based on a mutual trust and mutual understanding is something they are afraid of in uh, saudi arabia the ambassador recently met me they invited me to come to saudi arabia i don't know whether i should go maybe i can recommend professor vaidyanathan <laughs> to go to saudi arabia then they need to learn some laws of finance so maybe for you to go but i he was i asked him what is your approach to masjid because i just recently heard, saw a photograph of several masjids being broken in the makka area earlier on also they broke masjid to build the palace of the uh, of the sheikh which was bilal masjid where Muhammad used to read uh, namaz so at that time some archaeologists said that please please leave this masjid alone because saudi arabia regularly demolishes masjid and builds roads so i asked him is this he said yes because masjid is a place where you read namaz even when the bilal masjid was demolished and these archaeological people objected our king said that this is uh, uh, um, what is called in, in, in hindi as murti puja so what if uh, mohammed read namaz there it doesn't make it a sacred place masjid is a place to read namaz you can read namaz anywhere i would urge the muslim population of india please use that principle and that principle must be applied to ayodhya that principle should be adopted uh, applied to brindavan should be applied to kashi vishwanath can anyone deny that there were temples there before and they were demolished we'll build another masjid nearby beautiful across the saryun uh, river in ayodhya in another part of uh, uh, banaras in another area of vrindavan we build a masjid uh, for you but since it is not a religious place for you yes you may be feeling hurt that it was uh, a mob came and broke the masjid some people took their law into their hand, own hands but this is if a government decides and this is what the judgment on ayodhya by the constitutional bench of the supreme court said 
that only thing we are objecting to is the unauthorized demolition of Babri Masjid. But in the British time and in your Arab countries, in Pakistan, masjids are regularly demolished to build roads. This uh, one of the charges against Musharraf is that he demolished six masjids to build roads. So, if the Muslim community itself decides to say, yes, you are right, build us another one in a nearby place and we will clear it out only for these three. We are not asking for all the 3,000 over the country. And then what, a, what, an, what an atmosphere that would be built. But people don't want Hindus and Muslims to come together. And therefore, at some stage we have to make it clear. That yes, if we come to power on the basis of uh, the Hindu assertion of its identity, then we will certainly sit with the Muslim community, Muslim leaders and tell them that we have to do this. Do it with you, if possible. Do it with you if possible, without you if necessary, in spite of you if it becomes absolutely essential. So this is the new society, united Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Parsi, Sikh. We should, we say we don't want to interfere in any religious practice of yours, but there are some fundamentals which must be common. If Muslims can accept uniform civil code in Australia, if Muslims can accept a uniform civil code in America, if Muslims can accept uniform civil code in most of Europe, then I don't see why Muslims cannot accept uniform civil code in our country, which is part of the constitution. The problem is that no one has spoken to the Muslim community frankly. They are all the time playing on them. And afterwards don't do anything. Mulayam Singh is called Mullah Mulayam. But has he done anything for the Muslims there? Go and ask the Muslims. Has Congress done anything? They are now going to bring a bill, prevention of communal violence in India. Prevention of... <coughs> If you read the bill, it's shocking. I hope they bring it because then I'll get another chance to go to the court. <laughs> it says that if any Muslim complains that a communal riot has been engineered by a Hindu without investigation, that Hindu will be arrested and uh, put in jail immediately. Normally, today, if some Muslim goes and complains, there will be an FIR, there will be an investigation, then only the decision will be taken. But no, he says that immediately it has to be. And if you don't, then that police officer will be suspended. This is all brainchild of, uh, of Sonia Gandhi. It's the only bill that Sonia Gandhi has directly introduced in parliament through the NAC. I don't know what legality there is on that, because only the law ministry can introduce a bill. But today we have a NAC introduce bill, which they want to bring this week. We like to see. I hope she brings it. Because they do these foolishness, they will only create more Hindu consciousness in the country. Sonia Gandhi is up to no good, I can tell you. Her time is limited. Of course, all her time is limited, but uh, in her case, the doctors have limited her time. In your case, my case, God has limited the time. I looked at him and said it because I know he has some sympathy for her. <laughs> because he says that I am looking after, I am the only one concerned about her health. In the whole country? Yeah, in the whole country. And you are, uh, you are saying it as a criticism that I am the only one or you want more people to also be concerned about her health. <laughs> anyway, the issue is that this, uh, these people are not coming back to power. And if we play our cards correctly, the NDA will be definitely in power with an overwhelming majority. (laughs) 
that, that is what uh, Professor Vaidyanathan means by change in the air. On that I have no doubt. I, I used to have the same view during the emergency because I was moving underground. I was in touch with the people. When I told people outside India, when I went back, that India, if there's an election, will win it, they used to say, what is he talking about? Of course, I didn't think Indira Gandhi herself would be defeated. So, therefore, we, uh, we need, therefore, to know exactly what to do. We need, therefore, to be very clear that all the science today says that Aryan Dravidian theory is bogus. It says that the, the world today, world research says that the most advanced language, most computer friendly language in the world is Sanskrit. Today we have the resources of the world, we have five, uh, 12 months of the year we can do agriculture and only 25% is used for more than one crop when we can grow three crops. So the potential of India is enormous. But the problem is that we have got stuck with this. Italian lady who has been nothing but corrupt and she's reduced everybody into a psychophant. If you want to survive, you have to be a psychophant. Sometimes people tell me why you are against her. She is trying to be a good daughter in law of India. She wears the sari, puts on tikka, does namaste. Well, please read Ramayana. That same logic. Sita saw Ravan dressed in Bhagwa and she crossed the Lakshman Rekha and you know what happened. You can't be fooled by foreigners wearing your dress or doing this drama. So, of course, there is no possibility of now they are ever coming to Pa. That son of us is a big Buddha, so he has no chance. <laughs> And therefore I think that we must now start thinking in terms of how I as a PT can be a different person. As I say, of course you must know your identity. It's there in my book and this new uh, monograph I have circulated. It is there in that also. And uh, you must know, if possible, I would like you or if not possible for you to learn yourself, to propagate it, Sanskrit should be learnt, because it creates a vibration in your body which will change you. And you must have a positive attitude to the future. Yes, I can. What can I do as an individual? Of course, as an individual you can do. All through our history, individuals have stood up. Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya, he was an individual. Shivaji was an individual. Rana Pratap lost, but he was an individual who showed great independence. Subhash Chandra Bose, in the South Katabhoman, Rani Chennama in Karnataka. So individuals matter a lot in our system. In our theology, Hindu individual is very important. So think of yourself as as an instrument of God, as an individual who is having a positive view, not that thing will happen, one event in the press, you get depressed. Of course your enemies will try to bundle and say all kinds of things, but develop a thick skin, you need a thick skin, you need a skin of a rhinoceros to survive in this world. Don't bother about criticism, if you think you are doing right, that's all that matters, not what others think. So that kind of attitude you will have to develop. Now, I have only one thing to say. A major election is coming. You become now soldiers in that war, which is called election. In your area, find out where your booth is. Create a committee of five people. Get hold of the voter list of that booth. That means only thousand votes. A parliament, a parliament uh, 
uh, election has usually about 15 lakh votes. And there are about 1500 booths, which means each booth has a thousand votes. That thousand votes, find out who's there, who's not there. So that in the booth, when the party you want to win, you either sit as their agent or you assist that party to tell you who are the impersonators. Now it will be very difficult to use the electronic voting machine because I have won that uh, battle in the Supreme Court. <laughs> there, uh, the court has now said, has accepted my plea that if the election commission wants to use the electronic voting machine, it must have a screen where the name must come, the serial number must come, and the symbol must come. And then a, a voter slip must come out, which you see, and it drops into a box just attached to that machine. The election commission has agreed to do it. I asked them to do a trial run in Karnataka election. They said it was too short a notice. But in any by-election starting July, they are willing to do a trial run. And certainly for the next Lok Sabha election, whether it is in October or whether it is in um, May of next year, the electronic voting machine will be a new machine which this Tataka will not be able to manipulate. I also recommend, see in Hinduism there is no law. There is no law which says you can't do this, you can't do that. But the Hindu, Hindus generally say that if you do like this, then this will happen. If you want your mind to be free of vibrations, I mean disturbances, you want your mind to be steady, then it says be a vegetarian. But it doesn't say being non-vegetarian is bad. If you are non-vegetarian, then you will have tamas nature. But if you want a, a nature where you can meditate, then you have to be a vegetarian. The choice is yours. But I would certainly strongly recommend to all of you, don't touch alcohol. Like, <laughs> like cigarettes originally was very fashionable. It was a status symbol. Today, Nobody is recommending cigarettes. They in fact put warning that it will lead to cancer. Alcohol does two things. One, there is no such thing as moderate alcohol. The day you have a crisis, you will go over. You'll go over the line. But it affects your liver. So get these good habits. I'm not asking you to get up at 4 a.m. like I do. But... Because you must have a minimum of 7-8 hours of sleep. If not possible, all in one blow, then you must have it in the afternoon after lunch. But uh, if, if you want to be a different person, a different Indian, then your value systems will have to undergo change. Because today, the, to globalization, westernization, we have acquired all kinds of values from them, which now they are beginning to change. A big movement for vegetarianism in America. There's a big movement for being a, a teetotaler in America. There's even people uh, taking to our meditation and all that. But I don't. I want us to learn from ourselves and be a new Indian, self-confident, not depressed by failures. Every failure should make you committed to try again. Learn from. If you want to learn, learn from Muhammad Ghori. He lost 16 times. On the 17th time he came and established uh, his religion here. So don't give up on anything. Be clear on your goals and follow it with determination. And be the renaissance of India, which is coming in the next few years. Thank you very much.
thank you dr swami uh, we will be now taking questions and uh, before that uh, mr rajendran on behalf of the tevar samaj of bombay is going to offer a, a shawl to dr swami please be seated we will end the program around 6 o'clock